Good morning. Good morning. Greetings to one and all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for being here today and trust that you will sense God's holy presence and that we can give him the praise and worship due his name. And if you are watching by television or internet, I'm Ron Hipwell. This is the First United Methodist Church in Titusville. We're glad that you are here too. If you are a first time visitor, we do have welcome gifts available after the worship service in to the right in the narthex. And so we are glad to have you get those after the worship service. If you'd find the red registration folders, I'm usually holding mine, left mine sitting over there, but if you would find those and along the center aisles and up into the balcony, pass them along and return to the center, we'd appreciate that. If you have a prayer concern, uh, there, are pew car uh, there are cards in the pew racks in front of you, and if you could kindly fill those in if you have a prayer concern this morning, and they'll be collected uh, during our first song, and then you can, uh, we will lift those up a little later on. If you're a member of the Finance Committee or Church Council, uh, please do remember that there are meetings on Tuesday night for that, and I know I have friends lined up <clears throat> to my left ready to come on, so Penny. Hi, um, in your bulletins today, you have a blue sheet that kind of highlights, and I know it looks like a lot, but it really is just the highlights, of what Jeremy Reed went through during his four months of battling the H1N1 virus. We are having a benefit dinner next week after church to help cover his medical and other costs that have piled up because of his hospitalization. So uh, there are sign-up sheets in the back if you'd like to sign up to bring to supply food or, or to help or whatever. Um, but read this, not during the sermon though, please. And, um, Amen. <laughs> Just get an idea of what, what he went through, what his family went through, and just be here to support them as they're struggling to cover the costs of everything that have accumulated during his illness. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, next week is the last Sunday school curriculum for my elementary teachers. So for the summer, we are going to use this book. It's Study God's Plan. And I put on here, I'd like, really like to have two people each week because all the elementary downstairs will be together. So I'll put this on the back in the vestibule. And if you could please sign up for a week, that would be great. Thank you. Hi, just wanted to thank the uh, folks who came out to uh, help do the mulch. Uh, yesterday, and uh, we're going to have another uh, time to encourage the congregation to join us on Saturday the 31st to uh, uh, finish the uh, east side and the front of the church and have a few other things we'd like to do. So that'd be 9 to 12 on Saturday the 31st, and hope to see you there. Thanks. I have one announcement uh, in regards to the youth group and the Birmingham mission trip this summer. The youth group is going to be meeting at the Parsonage this afternoon at 4 o'clock. So if you are either part of the youth group or part of the youth group and going on the trip um, to Birmingham, we invite you to be here at the church at a quarter to four. And um, you can drive up, right up on the church van uh, with us or you can just meet us up at the Parsonage at 4 o'clock. Thanks. Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> hey, today the uh, organ is not working. So um, it's a minor problem, but it was just discovered. And uh, so sorry, we're going we're gonna to be enjoying piano this morning instead of the organ. And so also we want to take just a couple of moments and celebrate who we are in Christ and share the love of Christ with one another. So will you please rise and greet each other.
please join me in the call to worship. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. thankful for the history of this church, Lord. We're thankful for the pastoral leadership that you provide us. We pray for in the hour ahead, we would clear our minds of the activities of the day. We would focus on worshiping you. We are thankful, Lord, that you love us just as we are. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you, choir, and it is time for the children to come on down and share with the message, so please do so. to see you today in the message when I'm talking later some of you might be downstairs but I'm going to be talking about the word that we call faith faith and believe and I was trying to think of some way that I can explain it to you and so I'm going to come well I'm going to do it right here I just need to stand up if I could do that all right now I want you to watch me for just a moment but if I go like this. Do you think if somebody came and sat on my arms, do you have the faith to believe that I would hold you up? No. Yes. yes and no. See, the people that love me said yes. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, okay, why don't you think it would work? Because you would fall off. Yeah, you would fall off because it's not a very good chair, is it? No. Now I want to show you something. Now, let's say that I went like this and Ryan went like that. How many of you think that it would be safe to sit on our arms now? Yeah. All right, so most of you believe that that would work, right? All right, so Sam, we're going to see if you really believe. Okay, I can't get on here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, did Sam believe that we could hold him up? Yeah. He did, because he actually sat there. Some of you doubted, didn't know if you could, uh, could do that. So, that faith is, yeah, because we're so, no. But faith is like that. When God tells us he can do something, we need to not just say, hey, I believe. But no, we actually need to go trust him like Sam sat in our arms. It was one thing if Ryan and I said, hey, you guys can sit on our arms. We have a chair that's safe for you. But it's another thing when you actually sit there, huh? Were you nervous? I was nervous to fall down. Yeah, he was a little nervous to fall down. But he did it. So good job. Well, anyway, we need to trust God, put our faith in him to do the things that he says he will do. So good to have you all up here today. And let's pray together. Dear gracious God, thank you so much that you can hold us up. That you have shown us without question your love through the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. Thanks for each one of these children. Please bless them and their families. Thanks that we could spend these moments together today, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, this is Santa Fe Penny Day to collect mission money for the orphanage in the Philippines, so please go get it. Thanks.
says over there, you can join her on that side. Those that are going back to your parents, you know where to go. Thank you. And it is the time that we have the opportunity to give our tithes and our offerings for the ongoing life and ministry of our church. So the ushers are going to help us and thank you. Gracious Father, we thank you that salvation has come. And we thank you for the gift of grace and mercy that we have through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you that you've given us the charge to make disciples of all nations. And so, Lord, we are, as a people, we desire to work together to please you, to fulfill the mission you've given to us. And we give these gifts to you as well as ourselves that we can do just that. Give us the boldness and the courage to stand together and to lift up the priorities that you have given to us. And we pray it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Amen. Thank you, Tracy. You may be seated. We want to take the time to uh, share the prayer cards this morning, and so let me do so. One of the things that I want to share is that Lisa's mom, Brenda, has recovered pretty well now from her broken ankle, and so she's heading back south and uh, she'll probably be back to visit us, visit us another time, we trust. But uh, she wanted to make sure that the people of the congregation knew that she was doing better. She thanks you for your, their prayers that you've given, words of encouragement and the like. And so just get, if you get a chance to greet Brenda before you go today, that would be great. Also praying for uh, Chloe Walters. It's a week old or a week old baby for good health for Mark, Flo, John, and Margaret, for Isabel, Alice, Mary, Dennis, and Priscilla, for Donald Peer and family, for Marion Crawford, Dan Way and family, Martha Page, who's healing after back surgery, for Dick Burt and Glenn Culbertson, for the Reed family, for Bill, and uh, that's a praise the Lord, cancer's gone for Beth Ann, who is having surgery. Uh, Chip Drake, uh, for his health and in need of a donor, and just want to throw in, in case you didn't catch that this week, he is on the kidney transplant plant list. And so that in and of itself is a big step. So praise the Lord for that, but now waiting for that donor. Uh, also, we're praying for... Mr. Jensen, Cindy's family, for Pat, Diane, Fran Whitehill and family, Bonnie and Bill, Linda and Gar Garvin. Uh, also for uh, Martha, Marlene, Traveling Mercies. Uh, for Teddy Muir and family, for the church family and f safe travels, Randy Daly, Karen, Amy, David, and our country. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear gracious God, we're grateful to be able to be here together. And Lord, we have not come to really see each other or to be noticed. We've not come here today to um, do something, whether it's play the piano or sing in the choir or pray or preach a sermon so that someone notices us. We've all come here today for one purpose only, and that is to remember who you are, the God of all that is, that the Lord over all creation, you're our creator. We've come here to worship you, to praise you, to give thanks to you for your incredible mercy and grace and love revealed through the Lord Jesus Christ, to rely on you and to be a people who uh, are not filled with ourselves, but who are filled with faith in you and in your promises and in your power. So, Lord, as we turn to you today, we come with confidence, not because of who we are, but because of you, as we lift these cards before you, you've already heard the names. There are praises here. Uh, there are petitions and prayer requests here. There are people who are traveling. There are those who are hurting, those who are lonely, even those who are lost. There are those who, who are awaiting surgery, those who are recovering from surgery, uh, those who are, have been with us for a while and now are leaving for a while. And, and Lord, with all of these tremendous circumstances, it's overwhelming to us, but nothing is impossible with you. And so we pray, Lord, for your intervention in each case. That right now and wherever people are that uh, these cards represent, that they would sense your loving presence. And that you would be with them through whatever the need is. And we give you the praise and thanks for that. And now open our hearts and minds as we look to your word, that we would hear what you have to say to us, and that we would be a people of faith in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Waiting for the, there it goes, the beep, beep, beep. And this morning we're continuing our series of messages on when in Rome, based on the book of Romans. And this is also 
You remember in the ancient days when Paul was taken as a prisoner to Rome, and when he wrote the letter to the Romans, Rome was the center of the known world at that time, but it was not um, a, it was a, the political center, it was the power of influence, it was the religious center, but not in a good sense. Uh, they did not worship God as we know him. And, and so when Paul was writing, it was not about, hey, do as the Romans, like we sometimes say, but don't do as the Romans do do as the people of God. And so we continue that series of messages, uh, but today we're looking at authentic faith. And we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 4, verses 18 to 25. We'll hear it all as the morning goes on. We're going to begin with just a little phrase of it uh, to introduce it. But authentic faith, and it goes like this. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. Now let your mind wrap around that just for a moment. Against all hope, Abraham in hope Believed. Now, how is that possible? Well, we'll get into that in just a moment, but I want to tell you a story. There was an elderly gentleman, 72 years of age. His wife had passed away, and he had one passion, one hobby left in his life that he loved to do and was still able to do, and that is he loved to go fishing. And so one day, it was a beautiful day, and so he got off to do his, his hobby of fishing, and it was kind of a quiet day out on the water, and not much was happening, and he's kind of sleepy. You know, he's got his line out there, and fish aren't biting, but all of a sudden, he hears a voice of someone saying to him, pick me up. And he looks around. He thinks, I must have been daydreaming or I actually fell asleep because he sees no one anywhere close to him. But all of a sudden, he hears the voice once more saying, pick me up. Well, he's a little flabbergasted by this, but he starts to look over the edge of the boat. And sure enough, there on the top of the water was a frog. And the man was kind of embarrassed. Again, there was no one around, so he felt safe. Are you talking to me? And the frog said, yes, I am. Pick me up, kiss me, and I will turn into the most beautiful woman you've ever seen. And I will be your wife, and your friends will all be jealous because you have me as your wife. Well, the man stared into the water at the frog for a couple of moments, thought about what had been proposed he reached over and picked up the frog, and he was fishing, of course, and he had one of those shirts that has a pocket. He put the frog in his pocket, has a little flap, put the flap over top of the, the frog, and all of a sudden he hears the frog from inside his shirt saying, Are you crazy? Didn't you hear me? Kiss me, and I will be this beautiful woman. The man lifted up the flap, looked in, and he said, Nah, at my age, I'd rather have a talking frog. <laughs> You remember the story of Abraham, don't you? He was 75 when he first got the call from God. And when God said to him, you are going to be the father of many, the, of many nations. 75 years of old, he gets this, but, and it says even then that Abraham believed God. But then there was a period of time that went on like 10 years. And nothing had happened according to what God had said. And so Abraham had tried some other things that were not God's way. But God comes to him again and renews the promise to him. Now 85 years old, he says, you're going to be the father of many nations. Well, it still doesn't happen. And another period of time goes on. And when Abraham is around 99, God speaks to him again and says, in one year, you're going to have a child. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think about it in the context, I imagine somewhat like that fisherman, Abraham might have been thinking even at 75, and then later at 85, and when he got up to 95, well, God, isn't there another solution? <laughs> isn't there something else that could happen? Bonnie and I joke, we've had kids in three different decades. I every once in a while say, well, here's another decade. Uh, I'm 63, but yeah, she's over there nodding her head. It's not up and down. It's, well, anyway, 
99 years old and he's told you're going to have a child again. Now remember what we read? Against all hope. In hope, Abraham believed. Now Paul is picking up the story of Abraham when he's 99. And telling that story of him as a, in faith. So today we want to look at how we can learn about faith from the life of Abraham. And so we're going to measure or see the measure for authentic faith. Now, there are all kinds of things that we could look at, but we'll certainly get a good idea in the verses that are before us today because that was the lesson of what Paul was teaching and, and I hope we can hear afresh today. The measure of authentic faith. The first thing that we recognize a measure of authentic faith is being persistent in God's promise. Persistent in God's promise. So, what, what do we mean? Let's look at verse 20. We'll pick up back. Remember the first part, against all hope, Abraham and hope believed. And then, and so became the father of many nations, just as he had, had, had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. And now hear these words. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God. Now we'll go on later, but let me just go ahead and pause there. Did you see that? He did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God. He was persistent in the promise of God. So the term faith and belief are often used interchangeably, even in these verses. And so it's essentially talking about the same thing, but we're told that he didn't waver. So he was indeed persistent. We are told that actually in the verses beyond, I didn't get there, that he was strengthened in his faith. Now, here's what I want us to think about for a couple of moments. When apparently you can have strong faith or weak faith, and that Abraham, the older he got, the stronger his faith got. Isn't that incredible when, when you think about it? Because it would seem like it was becoming more impossible the further down it went, but he was strengthened in his faith. Well, usually when we think of us being stronger, we think of us being, you know, bodybuilding and that we become bigger and stronger. But the idea here is not that we become bigger. We need to recognize that um, that what happened was that it became less and less of Abraham and more of God. Do we see that? It was less of Abraham because he had to get to that place where he was no longer, he was as good as dead and he knew that. But then as he trusted in God and his limitless power and what he could do, he believed in God. And so it came to that place of complete dependency on God. Not on self, half and half, 25%, 75%, but there was no other choice. It was completely and wholly depending on God. Now, you remember this passage alludes back to the early time in Genesis. And I want to look at, because this part of Genesis is actually quoted in the verses that I have been sharing with you from Romans, but it goes like this. He looked outside and said, Look up at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And then in verse 6 it says, Abraham believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. These words are when the promise of God was renewed. This was actually took place, as I said earlier, when he was about 85, 10 years after he'd first heard God saying to him that he was going to be the father of many. And so also notice that when Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he said something like this, Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith, be men of courage, be strong. And that strength comes from standing firm in the faith of God. In the book of Hebrews, it refers back to Abraham again. Now, someone recently said 
that there was this debate going on between some people about how were the people of the Old Testament saved. And some people concluded, well, it's on the basis of their character, on the basis of the law. But that's not what we see. We find something like a dozen references or more. I didn't really count them. But if you look at Hebrews 11, which we call the chapter of faith, there's reference after reference after reference after reference of people in the Old Testament. And how are they saved? By faith. Notice this, by faith, Abraham, even though he was past age and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become a father because he considered him faithful who made the promise. He was persistent in God's promise. God said it and he believed it and trusted in him. Now, on the screen, you can see a picture of the New River Gorge Bridge. I actually took that picture, but believe it or not, the words weren't over the top of it when I took it. But nevertheless, here is this incredible bridge. And I don't know if any of you have ever traveled on this, but I suspect that so those of you who have traveled south probably have gone over it at some point. But if the direction you're going leads you on Interstate 79 south and you don't want to go over to Charleston, you have to cut down Route 19 in West Virginia. And if you're going Route 19 all the way down to Beckley, you're going to go across the New River Gorge Bridge. And it's really very amazing. It's pretty, but... I, I want to show you just to help give a perspective, a picture someone else took. I borrowed this one. But it is, it is a huge bridge. Now, it is the longest steel span in the Western Hemisphere and the third highest bridge in the United States. As I said, it's located on Route 19. One day a year, they close the bridge down to car traffic and pedestrians are allowed to go out on the bridge. People will parachute off this thing. They will bungee jump. They will repel off it. So that day we're going to close down church and we're all going down there and we're all jumping off together. Oh, okay. Now, I just want to see if you're a people of faith. No, I, okay, no, that's not it. Now, I want you to get a sense of how tall this bridge is, the Willis Tower, the old Sears Tower in Chicago, which was a couple years ago the tallest building in the United States, but now the Freedom Tower in New York has been completed, and it's a little taller, but still gives that a perspective that it's just a little taller than this bridge. The Empire State Building is just a little taller than this bridge. So is the Eiffel Tower in France, but look at the Washington Monument, the Statue of Liberty, the Space Needle, the, the, the pyramids, and even the Gateway Arch in St. Louis, the gateway to the west. All these are much smaller. This bridge is up there. So, let's say that you are driving south on Route 19 in West Virginia and it is a horrendous night. It's been raining for hours and hours and hours and it's just an utter downpour. And you know that the valley is filling with water and rushing that stream down underneath the bridge. And you get to that point just before you cross the bridge. You have a decision to make. You can decide whether or not you are going to continue or in fear sit there on the other side until everything's perfect. What do you do? And if you go, is it your faith that protects you from the raging river below? No. It's the bridge that does the protecting. And when we understand true faith, faith is not what saves us. It's the object of our faith that saves us. Jesus is adequate. Jesus is the one who died on the cross, died the death that we deserve. What he did was sufficient, so our trust needs to be in him. He's the only one that can rescue us. And so, the next thing that we see in this passage is being persuaded of God's power. We're persistent in the promise, but being persuaded of God's power. Now we want to continue on where we were. Remember in 20 we said, yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God. And notice this, and being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. That's why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, 
Now catch this, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness for us who believe in him who raised our Lord Jesus from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and raised to life for our justification. Do you remember this whole idea of being credited as righteousness is necessary because not one of us here or anyone else in all the world is a righteous person. The Bible teaches that no one is good. We all sin. None of us are righteous before God. None of us has anything that we can offer to God to say, hey, I'm better than my neighbor. Save me because these are the things that I am and do. Doesn't cut it before God. There's no one righteous, the Bible teaches. And yet we're told that righteousness is credited to us. How? Through faith in the gift of God. What God alone can do is the foundation uh, of such faith. So look at it again. He was fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he said. God promised it and had the power sufficient to be able to do it. And God credits to us this righteousness through faith. It wasn't just Abraham alone, but all of us as well. And so we find this. Now, I want you to think for just a moment, it's kind of a silly picture, but, but how is it that we are plugged in to God's power? Well, we, we put our trust in Him, obviously. It has to do with faith. It's a faith issue. Uh, but remember that God delayed in fulfilling the promise to Abraham until he got to the place where he thought he was as good as dead where his wife is barren and had been for 90 years, and he, you know, was an old man of 99, and they were childless, and they needed to come to the place that they would see that this was a work that God alone could do. Because this was a significant moment in human history. Uh, this was not just any ordinary baby. This was a child of promise to help fulfill the plan of God to redeem and rescue the world, including us. And, and so God chose to work in a way that only he could work. And, and so Abraham did not walk by sight, but he walked in faith based in the promise and in the power of God. And the same is true for us. And that is that we need to be at the place where we give up. Where we know that it's not about us. That there's nothing that we can do to save ourselves. And that we give up and give in and say, Lord, you're my only hope. I, I, I'm going to trust in what you have said what you have promised, and I believe there's power in the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, sufficient for my salvation, for my forgiveness, and for you to enable me to live this life that you have called me to live. In Genesis 18, verse 14, once again, uh, Abraham and Sarah get this encouragement, is anything too hard from the Lord? And the promise comes, I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. In the middle of the Bible, in Jeremiah 32, 17, it says, Ah, sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. God has the power to do what he promises, what he says that he will do. And then in Matthew chapter 19, verse 26, Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are, are possible. So the conclusion here in this passage is that we come to the place to realize, hey, it's impossible to be saved by myself. It's impossible that we could have a relationship with God by myself. But with God, it is possible. With God, when we put our faith in Him and trust in Him completely and only, that makes our salvation possible. 
Now, I'm not a scientist, and I don't even need to explain that to you, and, and some scientific things are way beyond me, and I asked Gary in the early service not to correct me as I go along, but let me try to give you a simple illustration of the pendulum. One day there was a college student that was given an assignment and in this course for the assignment they had to teach certain classes. Well his was to teach on the principle and the laws of the pendulum. And, and so he wanted to illustrate it visibly as well as to explain it. So one day he, uh, and then when it was his turn to teach, he came into class. And he went up to the whiteboard in the front of the class, and he had a kind of a crude little pendulum, you know, with something weighted on a string, and he had a thumbtack, and he put it in the board at the top of the, of the whiteboard. And then he drew it up to almost it was, you know, completely in that direction, and let it go. And whoosh, across the whiteboard it went up and to the other side and he marked at the point where he let it go he marked as it got to the other place the, the, where it arrived on this side and each time it swung back and forth he put marks and of course the law of the pendulum is that it never quite returns completely as far as the point to which it was released it slows down as it goes along and so he marks that and he says then once the the pendulum has come to a complete stop he said how many of you believe in the law of the pendulum that it will never reach the highest point from which it departed and everybody in the class is yes that's what we believe including the professor who was sitting there teaching yes I believe that's true what you just illustrated and, and the professor started to get up and walk toward the front because he assumed that the lesson that this college student was teaching was over but it was really just beginning and so the, the, the student let the professor come forward and he said, I want you to help me further to illustrate the law of the pendulum. He said, I want you to stand against the cement wall here in the classroom. And so the professor backs up and stands there. And he hadn't noticed, but the student had a more sophisticated pendulum there. It was, you know, at the bottom of pretty high test line, don't know what it was, but there was about a 250 pound crude ball and he cleared a path the whole way through the room, kind of like this aisle from, you know, from the wall down there. And he had the professor stand there and then the student went and got that ball and brought it up to the nose of the professor and said, how many people believe in the law of the pendulum? The other are all doing it. He lets the ball go. Whoosh, whoosh, off it goes. And then it gets to the other end and starts its way speedily back toward the nose of the professor and he bolts. <laughs> and then the student said, does he believe in the law of the pendulum? And they all said, no, he didn't because he didn't trust that it would stop just short of his nose. But it would have because that's the law of the pendulum. Do we believe, even though sometimes it looks like a risk to us, what God says is so? Can we put our faith wholly in what God has promised, that He will save us who have faith in Jesus Christ? Or are we ready to jump because we think, well, there's got to be another way. That can't be it. Do we trust that what Jesus Christ did was not just for Paul, was not just for the people throughout the ages, but was for us as well? What we find in this passage is an illustration of the faith of Abraham, but we're told that it was not just for him, that the very faith that he exercised in the promise and in the power of God was also for us. And that the very same thing that God did for him, he would do for us if we put our faith in him. So, do we? Many times, the picture's kind of crude on the screen, and I'm sorry, but it, many times we feel a lot like this. That our life is filled with garbage, and we're overwhelmed with garbage. There, you know, we think of the things that we've done, we think of our failures, and we just feel overwhelmed by the circumstances, all the things that are around us, and we just think there's no way out. And, and even though it's an awful picture, I like how this hand is reaching up beyond the garbage. Because it, it, it illustrates that there is nothing 
in this person's life they can do, but then faith they're looking to the only source of help that there is, and that is to trust in God. How about you? Do you have a mountain you feel like you just can't climb? Are there circumstances that you face that seem just completely bigger than you are? Are you at that place where you feel there's, it's hopeless? Without hope, remember, in hope Abraham believed. Are, are you at a place like that where you feel that there is no hope? Maybe you feel like that spiritually. You just wonder, you know, I've tried everything I know how. You know, I've come to church. I've listened to Ron's sermons for years. That was supposed to be a funny line. And, and, and I'm still wondering if I'm saved. You know, I've put up with this. No, it's not about my sermons. Um, but, but you have wondered, you know, just I don't know if I have a right standing with God. Well, remember that it's not about you. It's when we come to the end of ourselves and put our faith wholly and completely and only in Christ that He can do the work that He promised to do. And He's promised that through His death we have forgiveness and through His resurrection God credits to us righteousness. And so today, we want to take a couple of moments to pray here at the end. But as we do, if there's anybody here today who you're just not sure where you stand with God, there are doubts, there are questions, you wonder, you know, you've tried everything you know how, that maybe, just maybe today, you've come to understand that there's good news that God loves you in Christ. And what Jesus did was sufficient. And it's about Him and not about you. And just, we need to in faith trust in Him and Him alone. Or there may be others here today too who, who just feel overwhelmed with circumstances and you know you've been relying on yourself and you just want to take the time today to say, Lord, I give up, but I, I'm going to trust in You. So I want to pray with you and I want to invite you to close your eyes and, and bow your heads and in just a couple moments give the opportunity if anybody wants to come pray for you or your health or any other circumstance to do so at the altar railing. But right now, in this quiet moment, if you'd close your eyes and bow your heads, I just want to ask if there's anyone here today who realizes that you want to give up and give in to Jesus Christ. You want to put, you want to say, Lord, I, I don't understand it all, but I believe what you said is so. You want to trust Christ to be your Savior and your Lord. He promised that he would when we put our faith in him. He is adequate and sufficient. So I just want to pray for you today. If there are people here who want to ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, please just indicate by slipping your hand up in the air, want to pray for you? Yes. Are there any? Yes. Anybody else? Yes. All right. Well, then, as we are just standing before our holy God, today, Lord, we, there are several persons who have said to you, they want you in their life. Lord, you do not lie. You keep your word. So ask, Lord, that you would touch each one in a way that um, they know that you are with them. Bring into them uh, the life you've promised in Christ. And, and thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness to us. And Lord, for the rest of us, whatever we face here today, um, help us to trust in you as with the kind of authentic faith that Abraham had where he gave up himself and put his confidence in you. So we want to give you our circumstances today, no matter how big they are, and give you thanks that in you all things are possible. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. As Jerome sings, if you do want to bring any kind of a circumstance before the Lord, we invite you to come. And let's join in singing with Jerome.
my soul will sing your praise on and Ten thousand years and then forevermore. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy. Dear friends, we say it regularly, but the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit are ours. Do we believe it? Let us go forth with confidence, persistent in the promise, and persuaded in the power of who God is and what He's done for us in Christ. Amen.